porter, an old established tradition in Irish drinking history. Why we've even got songs about it. If you want your child to grow, your child to grow, your child to grow. If you want your child to grow, give them the child of poor nursing poor. It's an acquired taste, of course. But at least it comes easier than the bitter thickness of stout. For just as England produced beer that was mild and bitter, so we developed porter and stout. This is the mild, plain they call it. You would always call for a pint of plain. Welcome friends, welcome back to another brew day. The strike water is in the kettle heating up. This is brew number 51. Today we're going to make a porter. Porter, a porter-ish. Um, this is based on a brew that we did a long time ago back on the channel. Um, if you are from Toronto and you're part of GTA Brews or part of the homebrew community in Toronto, you'll know who Eric Cousineau is. This is based on his recipe that he came in and did for Plumber Porter or Plumber's Porter. Um, I'm making a few changes based on things that I want to try. So I'm changing the base malt. He used Maris Otter. Today we're going to use Golden Promise. I'm going to put Golden Naked Oats in it because I think they could bring a nice mouth feel to the whole thing. You know, I'm just going to make it my own. And this is a beer that I'm not a huge fan of porters and uh, stouts. Julie loves them. So this is a beer for Julie. I do though, love cooking with them. So this will show up over on the cooking channel over and over and over again in different things that I want to cook with. So get the golden promise out here first. Of course, like all of our recipes, they are below in the description box. Everything you need to know about what I'm doing today is in the description box. Golden promise, Simpson DRC, chocolate malt, Golden Naked Oats, and into the grain mill. And we'll mash in. So I'm going to do a fairly standard uh, single temperature mash, 152 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour. This is um, this is a brew in a bag system. So I've got a couple of bags here because, you know, waiting on new ones to come. <laughs> the ones that I've got all have holes in them. So I'm waiting for new bags. So I've got this double bagged and this system has a recirculating pump, so it will recirculate for the entire 60 minutes of the mash. Okay, that's good. Lid on. Start the pump. Sticking fairly close to tradition and using UK style hops, most of the hops will be East Kent Golding in two editions and one edition of Fuggle. And today we're going to be pitching a London Ale Yeast, uh, White Labs 0013. Okay, 60 minutes on the mash are up. So, let's see what we've got here. Off with the pump. Take the lid off. Let's get a sample to check our gravity. So I'm looking for 1.037. And we'll try it. There's a whole bunch of different settings here. Let's see. One point zero three five. So we're off a touch. Lift the bag out. I'll just let that drain into there right now. I will come back and squeeze it. I do squeeze 
my uh, my mash bag and I'll hit the temperature up to get it preheating into the boil. So the initial gravity reading that I just took was off by 0 0.01, no, 0 0.001. I was hoping for 1.037 and I had 1.036. I'll take it again after I squeeze the bag. I'll squeeze the bag, give it a stir, make sure that I've got a good homogenized mixture of vert, and I will probably hit my numbers at that point. Okay, after squeezing, one point zero three seven. Can you see that? There we go. One point zero three seven. Bang on. Hit it. Good to go. And as always, before it comes to a boil, I put in my chiller coil. I leave it in there through the entire boil. Make sure it's sterilized and it doesn't, um, if you put it in, I found that if I put it in later in the boil, um, it slowed the boil down, brought the temperature down too much and then I was fighting to overcome it. Much easier just to put it in at the beginning. Same with the hop spider. Uh, like I said in the last video, I'm on the fence about the hop spider and in a brew coming up, I will probably ditch it altogether. Okay, we're up to a boil, and our first hop addition is East Kent Goldings. And in they go. At the 30 minute mark, we're gonna add some Fuggle. At the 15 minute mark, Yeast Nutrient and Whirl Flock. And at Flame Out, East Kent Golding. Okay, Flame Out. Turn that fan off. That fan could drive you nuts. Okay, um, last uh, hop addition right here at Flame Out. So in that goes, and I will turn off the heat. I'm now going to turn the pump on, and I'm going to let this sort of uh, whirlpool for 15 minutes. It's not really the whirlpool, but I'm going to whirlpool it for 15 minutes before I turn on the chiller, just to give that uh, last hop addition time to do something. Okay, we'll check our post boil or opening gravity. I'm looking for 1.045 and we get 1.043. Hmm. I've got lots of volume in the kettle. I could put it on, I could boil it a little bit more and get that last tiny little bit of gravity that I was looking for. Um, but I think I'm just gonna go ahead and start the chilling process. There we go. So the pump is still circulating. We're whirlpooling, immersion chiller, and it should drop really quickly. Okay, we are chilled. So, fermenter's ready to go, nice and clean. And I'm gonna pump this in and splash it around. In goes the yeast. Lid. And the airlock. See you in a couple of weeks. For years I worked in the movie business. And people who worked with me in the movie business um, often sort of joked half-heartedly that we didn't work in the movie business, we worked in the moving business because we spent most of our time loading and unloading trucks, loading and unloading equipment, moving all kinds of things everywhere, all over the city in order to get the shot. I kind of feel like brewing is sort of the same. Brewing's really about cleaning up and sanitation. Um, most of your day, your time spent is cleaning, and it's no different. While, uh, while the fermenter starts bubbling away over there, I'm going to finish cleanup of the kettle. The more essential part of it was the way in which it was drawn. Barmen could rise and fall on their ability to draw a pint of plain. 
Okay, so when the porter was finished fermenting, and I've already done all of the uh, all of the numbers, run the numbers, check the alcohol, check the fermentation, I stuck it in this chest freezer to um, to crash it to get all of the sediment and the yeast yeast to crash to the bottom of the fermenter. So I'm going to pull it out, and we're going to transfer it over to a keg now. Traditionally, porter. And when I mean traditionally, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, um, this would have been served in a cask, naturally fermented. It would have had lots of sediment. It would have low fermentation, uh, sorry, low carbonation. Um, and there's something to be said about a two pour system. See, it's drawn from two barrels. A high one first to give it a bit of life. A good glass full of gushing good cheer that settles slowly toward the bottom of the glass into a thick, contented cream. It takes several minutes for that cream to substantiate towards the bottom of the glass. While I'm going through and filling this keg, I'm going to show you a little clip from the BBC in 1973, which was pretty much a eulogy to the last cask of porter beer that Guinness made in 1973. When it's ready for the muscle and the sinew, the real body of the drink itself, and that comes from the other barrel of flat. And if it's all drawn properly, the way it should be done, then the cream is borne majestically above to form the clerical color that proves the goodness in its heart. Unfortunately, I don't think I can do that here at the house because Julie and I just are not going to drink it fast enough and to put it in a cask and leave it live It'll go bad really quickly. So into a keg low carbonation we go Okay, so before I started, the keg was purged, um, which is just getting all of the air out of the keg. So I filled it with CO2, let off the pressure relief valve, filled it with CO2, let off, did that three or four times to make sure that what was in there was CO2 so that I was having a fairly oxygen-free um, transfer. It's always going to be oxygen. Uh, I know there's people who get really, really out of control about that. That's not me. Um, now that I've got the lid back on and I filled it with uh, 20 pounds of pressure, I'm going to do the same thing again. Just to make sure that the headspace in here is just CO2. Get rid of any air or oxygen. And this first fill, I've pumped this up to uh, 20 pounds of pressure just to get that to seal really nicely. It'll go back into this freezer that's set at 4 degrees Celsius. And I'll probably only put it on maybe four pounds of pressure because I'm looking for about 1.5 to 2 volumes of carbon dioxide in order to carbonate this. I'm not going to force it to do it quickly. I'll probably leave it for a week before we even tap the keg and, and taste it out. If work was the curse of the drinking classes, then porter was their salvation. And yet, you know, it was not the traditional drink of Ireland the disciples would have you believe. This was a city drink. There were definite centers for it. It was the liquid lunch of countless working men in Dublin and Derry and in Belfast, where the shipyard drew most of its strength from the dark substance. It was the drink that waited for the men as the horn blew in the evening and pubs up the Newton Arts Road, around the station and up Ann Street, Short Strand, the pints of plain used to be standing in rows on the counter waiting for the onslaught from the yard. Oh, I just didn't you pour? Okay, so... 
Brew number 51, Jules. All right. Porter. It's nice. <laughs> so, I had a little bit of a foamy mustache there for a moment. Uh-huh. Um, it is nice. I don't like stout. You know this. I do know this. <laughs> I'm not a fan of stout, and I think it's because stout gets too roasty for me. I don't like it when it call falls into super coffee flavor. Super coffee, yeah. If you follow the cooking channel, you know I'm not really that into uh, coffee. I don't like uh, coffee at all. Neither am I. I. I couldn't sit down and drink a cup of coffee. No. And if it, if it gets into that coffee flavor, I don't like it. Anyway. This is kind of nice because it doesn't... It's roasty. It's dark. It's full it's malty but it's not it's not refreshing yeah That's it's good. not into that coffee it doesn't fill my mouth with coffee flavor i do find it kind of refreshing but of course <sighs> you haven't poured it right i haven't poured it right <laughs> i haven't poured it right so as you saw from that bbc thing in ireland the two part pour really was from two separate casks a cask that was still fully frothing and you know the yeast doing its thing and one that was flat essentially and the two combined together made that two-part pour i'd love to do that that's a lot of work but i just i just i just don't know how to make it i don't know how to make it work at home with just the two of us because you'd have to you'd have to brew them sort of a uh, week apart Mm -hmm. To get the one that was flat and the one that was still... Ten gallons of beer is a lot of beer. Yeah, and... I, and we got yeah. a few... <laughs> we already have yeah. ten gallons over here. As you can see, uh, brew number 52, a cream ale, is you know, just finishing up its fermentation. And brew 53... Uh, it's it's a lager. lager. It's, it's a lager. lager. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's still actively fermenting. So it'll be months before you see that. You'll probably see 54 and 55 before you see 53. But this porter is really good. I like this. I do like this. I'm not a huge fan of hoppy beers either. You're not going to see double and triple IPAs on this channel. No. No. But a porter. Um, a porter. This is good. I really like it. You this. will. So um, give this porter a try. Tell me what porters you make. If you make a porter at home, do you nitro it? Because um, this is carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Nitro changes the mouthfeel, changes the flavor, changes the whole it does. whole thing. Um, and did you know that Guinness actually made a porter before they made a stout? Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon. And porter became impolite. Lately, there have been less than a hundred pubs in Ireland selling it. And now, these are probably the last pints of plain you'll ever see in Belfast. For on the 30th of April, 1973, they stopped making it altogether. This was more than a way of drinking. This really was a way of life. Porter. The drink that launched thousands of ships. So I feel like this would go really well with like a meaty, something really meaty, like a meatloaf or hearty and... I've got a couple of things that I'm cooking over on the cooking channel. If you want to see this beer in a couple of recipes... Of course you do. <laughs> and over <laughs> the Glenn Friends cooking. Um, I am going to do a meat-based thing. Okay. Not saying what it is. I'm looking forward to trying it. And a cake. Okay. This would go really well on a cake. And there you've always solved what do you drink with... How do you know how to pair? You cook with it. You cook with it. So, this and cake. <laughs>